Okay, so my name is Philip Martin and I'm the co-owner of Philip Martin Gallery. I'm very happy to be here today. Um, we're with Brian Bress. It is uh, 9 a.m. here in California on the left coast and Brian, like I, live on the uh, east side of Los Angeles. Um, I wanted to just thank everyone for coming. Uh, this is part of a whole series of uh, talks that we've been doing. Uh, we've had conversations with Kwame Brathwaite and Tom Marie Dodge and Katie Cowan. And a lot of those conversations can be found now on our website. We have a little section that says video and a section that says in the studio. And so those two sections give you a chance to just learn a little bit more about the artists. Um, Brian, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, thanks. How are you? I'm doing great. So Brian is an artist that I've worked with for a long time. Um, I saw his show, uh, yeah, I went to his MFA uh, show. I saw he went to his studio in grad school. And Brian was an artist for me that was very interesting because I have training as a painter. And one of the big questions that I had in that conversation was that painting and video are on a continuum. They're both two dimensional media. And so Brian is someone who has always been really great at, at that kind of thing and having that conversation. Also is uh, an object maker, uh, a drafts person, collage, as you can see from the image we're looking at here, which is uh, a show that I thought was an interesting point place to start because you can see sculptures as well as a piece here that combines video and collage gives you some sense of that. So Brian, how did you kind of get into the video that you're known for and how did your practice evolve a little bit? So I got into the video that I'm known for. Um, I think the, the genesis of that goes back to grad school. I was at UCLA for painting, but I had a background in film and animation. And um, the paintings I was making started to evolve into sort of dioramas and sets in my studio. And as soon as I started to realize that they were becoming sets, it invited the question, well, what do I do in those sets? And so I turned on a video camera and I started using found objects as costumes. And I started making these, um, these uh, videos with a fixed camera on a tripod. And I was thinking about them with the same language that I would talk about the paintings I would make. I was making space, composition, light, color. And I would drag you know, my, my painting cohort in there and professors in there and ask them to speak about these videos. Uh, with the language of painting. And so that was, I think that was how I got started making these objects. And so um, what was the reaction to people who were more involved in traditional medium in terms of seeing problems solved uh, through video that maybe they had thought to solve through painting? Well, it was, it was, all, it was all, obviously there's a, a big spectrum of the response you can have to that type of work. I think a lot of people, especially those who would consider themselves sort of connoisseurs of painting, had no problem with it. They wanted to see their students, um, particularly the professors, wanted to see their students pushing those boundaries and asking, you know, what is a painting? What materials can you use to make a painting? What can be a proxy for the canvas? Can the screen be a proxy for a canvas? Yeah. And so professors like Larry Pittman and Hirsch Perlman and, uh, um, uh, Roger Herman, all those professors were really excited because, you know, they've looked at, a, you know, thousands and thousands of paintings and they come into a, you know, uh, an MFA studio and they see a guy with like a bunch of video screens that he bought yeah. and is going to return to Best Buy <laughs> on his wall, <Yeah. laughs> you know? We won't talk about that. Um, yeah. So, you know, a big part of it, of course, is that, you know, I often think about painting art historically in terms of some of the poses or some of the whole conversations around, say, what I would call a dress, which is a kind of conversation across the picture plane. I want to obviously get into that because you, of course, are, I've been wanting to have this conversation since the whole COVID thing started because screens, which used to seem like such an anomaly uh, for many people, you are obviously very prescient in terms of that relationship. But just briefly talk a little, a little bit about performance and a lot of this is we're going to actually talk about works and stuff. Um, so you obviously went from sort of performing before the camera and certain kinds of things to actually kind of changing. You want to talk a little bit about performance in your work? Yeah, so, you know, I think that performance is one of those, um, is one of those components to my work that 
uh, I don't, I don't overthink it too much. I know I don't really think of myself as a performer. However, I know I am. It's just there's so much else going on. There's collage and drawing and sculpture and lighting and and video production and all these other things. That performance is just is the thing I get to do on Wednesday or something. You know what I mean? Like it. It's and I feel so comfortable and I get such a um, it releases endorphins. You know when I'm in the costume is. Yeah as claustrophobic as that is and as horrifying as it is to a lot of people to be in that costume when i'm in there i'm psyched because there's a that's when the 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 chaos can start and the unpredictability gets yeah. inserted into the work and that's when yeah. the work comes alive until that happens a costume as as sculptural as it is and as proud of the the craftsmanship i, I as as i am it, it, do, it doesn't have life yet. And that's why I love the little mistakes that happen in, in a performance and the things that go awry and that I can't predict because I think people sense that, that um, sort of teetering on failure and, and what looks good <laughs> and what looks bad. And that, that's exciting to people. Yeah, so, well, I mean, I think that you're obviously, as I keep repeating, you know, very much a maker. I think that, um, you know, of course the works are all straight shooting. We'll get into that a little bit, meaning that, you know, it's done in one take, there's no special effects. It's very physical in terms of what you see. And obviously you do make everything. In this case, we see an array of sort of head pieces. Um, mm -hmm. There's the kind of scarf component or the, the this part that kind of comes down here, the, the dicky, I guess. Dicky. <laughs> um, the masks and then back in here is actually, that's your head, right? Yeah, so um, we, I have one right here, actually. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, I'm fortunate to be able to have, um, at any one time, really talented people come to the studio sure. and, and help me make these things. And to help me make that <laughs> fit on me exactly, we cast, we cast. Yeah, my, totally screenshot time. My, my, we cast my torso. So, and we, and then we made this foam yeah uh duplicate of me that we can pin into and make these perfectly fitted costumes around me and then i don't have to be putting on the costume every two seconds and having sure. pins in my head sure. so um so yeah i mean there's uh i don't know how i got on particular on that but that's that's one of the like the fun parts is you know being able to make these things fit exactly on my body and then perform and then them. of course you're standing in a shallow set um in these pieces so here in this image you know you're drawing one of these set designs that is that appears behind you or no actually excuse me this is the back side of what you're cutting through yeah um, so it's like an advent calendar where i paint right. on the back side cut it and then it peels out to reveal what was on the back as this hanging kind of chad on the front <laughs> yeah and then uh obviously people can see the dog and cat co co costumes behind you and here's mm -hmm. just a little bit of a shot in terms of some storyboarding ideas but again We'll just get into it. So I'm going to just come move out of this here and uh, we're going to move into this. I am not ready to update my uh, you update QuickBooks right during this. Okay. Yeah, I'm not going to do that right now. Um, right. Let's uh, start here. So let's get see. I'm going to generally it'll be bigger, but in this case, because I know people might have a window open and this is a longer one. We'll just get and get going with this. So um, what are we looking at, Brian? We are looking at me wearing three rabbi costumes that were based on the different sects of Judaism, conservative, orthodox, I mean, uh, orthodox, uh, reform, and conservative. So um, I uh, grew up Jewish, was raised as a, you know, a, Jew, a reformed Jew, and so I have a little bit of experience with rabbis. Um, and uh, this is a video um, that's in a ser part of a series of videos that I call Drawers, where I wear costumes based on, usually based on occupations, and then I make drawings in each costume um, without being able to see, um, and I make those drawings on glass. And in this case, um, it's a triptych, so I'm in each costume, and I'm making blind drawings that are then synchronized um, with the other takes, and um to create a what one larger piece so in so this case take a take a step back there i mean there's a lot of things i oh, want to dig into there i mean in sure. terms of you know 
how do you choose the costume? So I know with the rabbis, you know, we talked a lot about people that you're proud of, people that have made connections with you, people that are yeah. creative. Like, what does it mean to take a kind of everyday person, but yet an incredibly special person like your rabbi, and put them into a piece? What is that? What is? How do you choose your characters? Right. So the early on, I was choosing characters that were just specifically not associated with being creative. Like I picked a cowboy or a fireman. I picked these professions that were kind of archetypes of jobs, but not associated with creativity. Because then I, I just wanted to explore this idea that like creativity didn't only, just doesn't only exist in the art world. It exists everywhere. And yeah. that everybody draws or doodles or does this thing. And so the idea of watching firemen draw and then sort of doing the mental gymnastics of figuring out why firemen were drawing, um, you know, dancing bananas was, was, yeah. was beautiful. And I think that it, it met this requirement of, ask, of, of good art for me, which is it asks more questions than it answers. And, and your and work so, creates homes for people. You know, people, everyday people, everyone finds a home in it. It's really amazing how people see themselves in, this, in your work. Yeah, there's a lot of different entry points. I mean, I think the biggest compliment to me is that, you know, a four-year-old can come up to the work and, totally. and just be surprised by it. But then also somebody who's well-versed in his art history, you know, maybe a curator or something with tons of experience in the art world can have that a similar experience. And I like to think that when you're, when the Venn diagram of people that are, that are interested in is, you know, when that overlaps in a big way, that's exciting for me. Yeah, so when you get into this question, so, just, just going back for a second. So just so people know in the drawers, and we're gonna see a second one here, what you're saying is that you are each of these people, yeah. but you can't be them all at the same time, obviously. Yeah. So that means each one is a performance that will last, that you shoot on one day, and then maybe the center screen you shoot on the next day, and then, and then the third screen you shoot on the final day. So talk about Lucky. how you communicate, how, you're, how, you're, how that all works. So, um, you know, shooting the single ones, obviously, I draw, I have a storyboard that I draw out so that it can exist in my head and I can imagine it when I'm drawing. That also happens for the, the triptychs, but what I like to do is for the triptychs, I need a, I need a baseline of, of the first performance. So without doing anything, I just draw out all these drawings. So I draw the old ladies with the fruit hats and then I draw a baseball game and I draw, uh, you know, a limousine and in that, you know, the limousine, I draw just the back of the car. And then what I do is I go up into the computer and I look at the, the entire performance and I carefully write down exactly how long everything took. Uh -huh. So you draw a limousine for a minute and 24 seconds, erase for, for another minute, pause for 10 seconds, et cetera. Got it. So you do, the, long... you do one screen first and you use that as the exactly. template by which to map. Then, then I have a really, um, have an assistant who during the next take says, okay, draw the middle of the limousine now for a minute and 24 seconds. And right. so it's hard for me to hear. So there's another assistant who's handing me fresh markers and erasers down by my left side, just off camera, like down here. And they'll be tapping my leg or, you know, they'll, they'll hand me a new marker or they'll hand me an eraser when the other assistant says erase hand me a new eraser, erase, throw the other, other one away. So that's what's going on. So during these, during these, the, the, the two last takes or the two other frames, I'm carefully trying to match a performance I did before. Right. And then of course it appears seamless to, the, to those of us watching it. Now, this is a, a brand new piece uh, with, the cat, with the cat costume. <laughs> and yeah. I, was, I love this. It's like, <laughs> It's like, is this what's going on in the cat's mind as it's trying to figure out? <laughs> it's like, if I can just jump from the tree to the table, I could like, so, again, I, I could cause a rally in the stock market. <laughs> so obviously, I think, I mean, I think that we're, we're the, bit, the elephant in the room here is humor, you know, yeah. and we haven't quite hit, that, hit on that yet. And one of the really uh, great uh, pieces of advice I got from uh, Larry Pittman in grad school was he goes it's funny don't try to be funny it's right. funny don't try to be funny right i think that like there's a dead like when i'm wearing a cat costume <laughs> and 
you know, drawing, that's already funny. And so baseline, you just have to pull the performance back. And it's yeah. like, you know, that's why the cat has this kind of deadpan look on its face. And yeah. that's why the draw, I think that the idea that this is like a, a boring diagram or something is, is funnier and more compelling oh, totally. and more interesting than if he was drawing something like, like wacky or something. Oh, no, I mean, totally. yeah, no. And then a lot of so pieces obviously end with a self portrait. So the figure yeah. will, or they, you know, the figure draws a self portrait. And I think this is a particularly funny self portrait that gets to the next part of the question, which is that you can't see what you're drawing, right? So there's no eye holes no. in the mask. <laughs> And, and you're drawing oh, look at that. because it's this act of generosity of communicating across the screen to the viewer. So if people just look at that mask for one second, there are no eye holes. He's not seeing through the cat's nose or something like that. So you're blind drawing in this kind of like remembered performance. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so I think that there is uh, there's a kind of um, muscle memory to drawing and also a kind of part of drawing that ha happens in your mind uh, just m seconds before it and it's on the page like i see it on the page seconds before my pen makes that mark uh -huh. and, and and sort of and so all i'm doing is just not looking at the page but only looking at that what that uh -huh. moment is in my mind when i'm making that mark so that's the process and it's about sort of trusting that that experience um is going to yield like a drawing that looks like anything, right? Well, Ace and I, or sorry, my son and I were watching this and just, this is the best cat self-portrait like of all time. So, uh, um, I think that's what it, it is, a cat self-portrait, right? This one isn't the cat self-portrait. Okay, because we couldn't no. tell. We were like, is this a Yeti? No, what no, is? but I think that that, like, again, gets it was really interesting because like, you know, there there's a kind of, when I was a kid, you know, drawing was <laughs> Oh, and then it's crying. It's sad. Yeah. Drawing wasn't just something you did to get the, the final product. It was something sure. that you did and all your friends gathered around and watched you draw. Like you were yeah. the kid that would draw and that was performative. And they would chime in and be like, draw this or draw that. Or right. when we became adolescents, it was like all bets off what they wanted me to draw. But sure. so there became this performative aspect to it. And so watching somebody make art is, to me, as, as satisfying as getting to experience that art as a standalone object. Yeah. No, I mean, I think that's, it, that is, again, you know, one of the things that I think is really interesting. And for people who own your work, you know, um, a lot of people that own it, you know, they talk about how they have all this other stuff in their houses, you know, amazing things. And um, a lot of times your work is really just gets, it, it attracts people, I think, because you know, we all have this this feeling of ownership over screens. Um, it's a medium that's a popular medium we all feel completely engaged in. There's no sense of high or low. We would never talk about high or low, really, with regard to media. I mean, maybe some avant-garde film or whatever. Um, but, you know, it's something that we're all kind of enga engaged in. Anyway, I, I'm going off topic there. But let's talk about this. This is one of the, um, this is, so this is a slicer. So talk, yeah. this is what you were draw, painting on the back of in the first shot. You want to talk a little bit about this. And for people, it's a little hard for them to see. So basically, he, Brian is cutting through a, can, a piece of canvas that has printed image on it of a forest. Behind it is a uh, drawing that we saw that's now flopping forward as he cuts it. He's wearing a costume. <laughs> yep, he's, he's cutting through something like this. He's wearing a costume printed with the same fabric. And then he's standing in front of a background. So, sorry, maybe I answered that, my own question, but talk to us a little bit about these people. Well, no, that sums up the logistics of it, but I just want to get at a little bit of like, okay, so that's what's happening, but I'd like to sort of just dig into a little bit about why I'm doing this and what, sure. this, where the idea came from. So for me, <clears throat> I had been, you know, I'd been making the drawers and making uh, pieces where I sawed through the the a piece of wood that was yep. very much right against the focused picture plane, and that wood became a proxy for the picture plane. And yes. but <clears throat> I had never really worked with with canvas, which was literally this thing that I was always trying to make the proxy for because I didn't know a way to interact with canvas performatively that would yield. Um, 
the right amount of chaos, but also for me, because I'm a control freak, the right amount of controlled chaos. Yeah. Like my yeah. job as an artist is to create situations that will yield interesting results without too finally putting a point and saying what I want that result to be. Yeah. And so this seemed like the perfect chance to take, you know, I called thousands and thousands of, of like found paintings of like palm trees, right? Which is its own pleasure in just <laughs> research because everybody paints palm trees. There's so many palm tree paintings and one palm tree on its own is just a palm tree painting. But when you collect them all together, they just become this chorus of everybody saying the word palm tree in their own accent with their own pronunciation. And it just became this beautiful like collage that I could put together, right? So that was like- And I, I mean, there's Cezanne and stuff in here, if I recall, I don't- oh. Yeah, okay, from so. on to like Sunday Painter, it's sure. all, there's a, there's a kind of like all over everything is fair game yeah. as far as the imagery that I would use, right? And then art historically, of course, you know, cutting through canvas like this gets you into people like Eve Klein or Gutai in terms of performance. Now I'm just going to say that we've got about 10 minutes left. And if you okay. want to yeah, ask questions, can. they can put it in the Q&A. I, I okay. don't quite, in the chat, I should have figured this out by now, but maybe Brian, if you want to just take a look at that stuff, you can see if there's anything okay. there that you might like to I, answer. Um, okay. But going on back to the next, to uh, this one. Okay, so, um, so we're skipping on to these right now, right? <laughs> sure. Okay, sorry. So the, uh, I, I asked anyway, a million the, questions at once, don't worry about it. Okay, no, so um, now we're skipping on to um, these pieces, which are, you know, so you can make a blind drawing. Okay, that seems to enter the realm of like possibility, but can yeah. you make a blind sculpture? Yes. And, um, you know, throughout the, the these works, I've been trying to figure out if you could do that. And in this case, I'm not in these costumes. I'm actually directing the activity of two, yeah. um, two people that are, are performing in these costumes. And what I did is I made these magnetic masks and then I made these little sculptures that I turned into magnets and I asked these people who couldn't see what they were doing and I directed them what to do. And so we had two cameras set up live and uh, when they reach, or reach through the screen, they're reaching into the other person's space and there became, it's, it became more than just this idea of can you make a, 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 um, a blind sculpture, it became a whole I mean, I think at one point you said to me, because there's nothing more existential than taking somebody <laughs> taking your face off of theirs. And yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you also had a great title for your show, which was, uh, well, one of your many museum shows, which was called Brian Breast Make Your Own Friends, which I always yeah. thought was really poignant. And yeah. this one I think is poignant too, because you've got this beautiful costumes, obviously. They're derived from um, uh, ballet and some of the ballet costumes of the say 30s and 40s um, yeah. but here you know you have people who are not performers so they're experiencing what you experienced kind of for the first time and there's this tentative yeah. quality to it that you kind of sense that I think is really beautiful yeah you know they were just sort of they, they've never felt these pieces before they didn't sculpt them they didn't have anything to do with making them this was the first time they felt them so they were really you know, they were afraid of breaking them. They were afraid of doing something wrong. So there's this sort of gentleness they have and they're working with each other. Maybe they don't even know each other, I think. And so, you know, there is a kind of sweet gentleness to the way that they're interacting. Yeah. Now, for this, it's so funny. I made these costumes and the whole thing and then I put one on and I was like, I could do this, but I don't think anybody else could. So I put USB powered fans in the back of their heads <laughs> air into them because I was so afraid that they would be uncomfortable. <laughs> That's so nice. Yeah, so they have their, it's a, a goofy, if they turned around, you would see this like computer <laughs> fan on the back of their head. Yeah. So again, we have about, about five minutes left, but yeah, this one just has this kind of beautiful feeling of color and, and we should now, I think at this point, what the initial question. So we're living in a world of screens. You know, yeah. we talk, what, what, what's your perspective on your work now that there's so much screens in our lives with Zoom and all this stuff? Well, you know, for me, um, I think that uh, the screen is so ubiquitous. We feel so comfortable with them. And there's so, it's such a powerful way to show imagery mm. that, it, you know, for the last 10 years, 
the, the writing that seems to be in been on the wall for me as far as what how how much potential these objects have because of their ability to be a proxy for so many um, for so many surfaces and then also to to be the container for so many types of art making yeah photo sculpture you know I I I think that the the challenge is just how do you take that screen mm -hmm. which is so ubiquitous and people are looking at it so often and yeah. what and what do you put on it that makes people that doesn't alienate people from the imagery or but connects them to the real world and so my sort yeah. of general rule has always been show them something that exists in a real space that is subject to the real laws of physics and and gravity and all these things because they'll that, that you you still need to connect back to people's bodies, right? And people's mm -hmm. emotion. And so this, and so for me, that's, that's been the sort of balance, you know, you use the screen, you use all this technology, but then you show them real physical objects and real right. painting and real mark making and cuts and drips of sweat coming out of the costumes. All these things are, you know, the sort of the yin to the yang of the screen. And, and then and to add to that, you know, of course you do insist that um, the work be on a monitor and be on the wall like the painting. You wanna talk a little bit about why that's important to you? Yeah, so I think that like, you know, there's this, um, there's this tendency for video works to sort of not get seen, to get lost and to suffer um, the sort of invisible nature of like sitting on a shelf somewhere. Sure. But there's also the one-to-one -one relationship of scale that can really only happen with this very <laughs> precise system. You know? I was about to say, and oh, then sorry, there's the know. variables that involved when it does get picked up off the shelf. What screen is it on? How is it being seen? And so right. for me, I think that like, just with that video with the diptych where they're reaching across the screen, they're yeah. acknowledging that they're in this box as soon as they reach out and go into exactly. another box. And that you're looking at it. You know, I think that's the thing is we all have this experience of like, going to a museum and you're looking at a burger or a queen, you know, or a duchess or something and, and, and you don't know who this person is and we like study these people we don't know and you have this conversation across the screen with a painting that we just rationalize because that's one to one yeah. figure to figure is, I guess it's natural to our psyche, but it is an odd thing when one steps away to think about it. And I always feel like the work plays on that. Yeah, I mean, I think that the scale is really important and people ask like why, why that screen size or what's going on. And I think it's about connecting back to that physicality, like one-to-one -one relationship, the costume, the things are the same size. There's this feeling, the illusion is, is more powerful, you know? If I, blew, if I blew the screens up and blew the characters up to the size of a billboard, I think that it, it would be powerful and amazing and huge, and, but like, would it still have that same physical connection? I, I don't know. Well, you um, obviously did that in Times Square. I mean, you did that amazing piece in, in Times Square yeah. where you did actually then take on a massive digital screen to address the public in, in a massive yeah. way. So yeah. also very like intriguing questions for a next uh, chat. Yeah. So Brian, thank you so much for doing this and joining us today. Thank you so much to everyone for coming. Brian, do you have any final yeah. thoughts you want to add? No, thank you so much for good questions. Thank you for everybody for joining me. I see questions popping up, but they go really away really fast. So maybe I can answer those. I don't know if I can answer those offline or respond to people. Sure. Um, um, hopefully uh, I'll be able to answer some of the questions. Um, Great. Well, thank so you everyone for joining us today. Um, it's been a real pleasure. I'm having a conversation with Daniel Dove tomorrow at 9 a.m. Uh, Pacific time, 12 noon Eastern. So please join us. And um, again, I just have to say that it's been one of the fun parts of all of the crises that we've had has actually been watching the art community respond, um, interacting with people and really sharing it. So thank you so much for joining us and being part of this experience. Thanks, Brian, really appreciate it. Thank Talk you, to you later, have a good day.